if Ukraine wins, Europe for sure will be more free and more peaceful. But if Ukraine loses, there would be neither Europe, nor freedom, nor peace. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Bali. My name is Sophie Rutefrans. I'm a program editor here at The Bali, and tonight I will be your host. Four times a year, the Bali invites someone who knows from personal experience what it means not to be free to give the Freedom Lecture. And it has never occurred that we have this Freedom Lecture from a country that is currently at war on the European continent. So it's a very special occasion for us. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank Stichting Democratie and Media and Het Veefonds, um, without whom it was not possible to organize these series of lectures. Um, we're going to listen to the 35th Freedom Lecture, and it is given by Vasil Cherepanin. Um, he's currently at Ukraine uh, at the moment. He's also the head of the Visual Culture Research Center, an award-winning institution he co-founded in Kiev in 2008 as a platform for col collaboration amongst academic, artistic, and activistic communities. It is also the organizer of the Kiev Biennale and a founding member of the East Europe Biennale Alliance. His lecture is called, If My Pen Were Worth Your Gun. And please give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends. I hope uh, just give me a sign if you hear me and see me well, because I actually don't see anybody in front of uh, the screen here. Uh, so um, first of all, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again uh, for, for this uh, opportunity. I'm very honored and pleased. Uh, to deliver a talk at the Bali again. Uh, I love this uh, beautiful location so much. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my thankfulness to uh, the organizers of this event, uh, to Sophie, to all the De Bali team, and also personally to Jolien Vermeulen, who made this all uh, possible. And uh, also, uh, as I'm in Kyiv, uh, I also would like to express my deep gratitude uh, to the Ukrainian military, uh, without which uh, I wouldn't be able to sit here uh, and talk to you uh, about freedom. Uh, and uh, without uh, the Ukrainian military, my country wouldn't be free and perhaps would exist uh, in a totally different form. And I also suppose that you over there in the European Union uh, would be perhaps busy with totally different tasks uh, and maybe not uh, organizing uh, discussions, uh, but rather something else. But for sure that uh, in that case, we would be all less free much less free. Uh, as uh, as uh, it was kindly uh, said, uh, mentioned already in the introduction, uh, the, the premise of such talks is basically that uh, it is somebody who experienced uh, unfreedom uh, is supposed to deliver the lecture on, uh, on freedom. But uh, I would rather reverse uh, this uh, Mm, this idea, because I would rather claim that this uh, uh, that in under the current circumstances, uh, freedom is actually totally on the Ukrainian side uh, in a way. But let me uh, start first uh, with um, explaining the title of uh, of today's talk. Uh, if my pen were worth your gun. Uh, it's it's not a, a, a my my title. I borrowed it uh, uh, from uh, from history basically, because uh, that uh, that's the title of the second international writers' congress in defense of culture, which took place in 1937 uh, at the crucial historical moment 
which uh, is very much resembling the one we have uh, and we go through uh, today. Uh, this International Writers' Congress, uh, the second one, it's basically an, was an international uh, organization of anti-fascist uh, intellectuals, uh, and uh, they gathered uh, more than 100 representatives from all over the world. And interestingly enough that uh, it took place uh, in Valencia, in Spain, uh, after Franco already started his attack on Madrid. And uh, it became very well known as an act of opposition to fascist barbarity of the time. Something which is, again, very much needed uh, today as well. And uh, the, the reason why I decided to borrow this title from, uh, from uh, that gathering is basically uh, because of their position that uh, being under uh, such harsh circumstances, those uh, writers and intellectuals uh, were uh, courageous enough to condemn the non-intervention policy implemented by the Western states of the time. So, uh, and this sounds unbelievably radical for today, right? Because we still know that uh, many in Europe nowadays uh, still reside in their ivory towers of uh, what is usually called non-escalation or in a poetical daydream of uh, the so-called pacifism. But uh, what I evaluate most is this... Uh, really unbelievably courageous commitment of the of those writers and intellectuals uh, commitment to a new revolutionary humanism that should be uh, struggling in order to achieve and ensure human dignity and uh, people's freedom on the european continent and for that matter fighting fascism and uh, it, I think that it's basically the, the uh, challenge that we face uh, today as well, because uh, the moment that we are going through uh, exactly right now, uh, the outcomes of this uh, moment of war will be absolutely defining for the rest of the 21st century, whether this century, our century, will be more free or less free. And um, I think that uh, there are many reasons why we have to put the question like that uh, today, because uh, so many decades after the end of the Second World War, we, we know it for sure today that uh, this uh, never again slogan became just uh, a ritualistic one. And nobody in the United Europe actually thought seriously that there would be necessity to defend freedom again and by military means again. And uh, the reason why we are challenged by that today, I think uh, in the United Europe, in the European Union or elsewhere in the West, is basically because uh, what I would claim uh, was a kind of a substitution of freedom with liberty. Because as we all know, there are two words in English which designate uh, the respective phenomenon, right? So in this sense, I'm referred to freedom as a kind of a notion or a concept of um, more sort of abstract one, which, which resides on a kind of a meta level, uh, which is rather a precondition for liberty, which is uh, an ability to act even in spite of some social rules or habits, even ability to trespass them when needed. Like for instance, in case of uh, uprising or revolution, whereas liberty, is rather a concrete embodiment of this phenomenon. It is supported by a set of rules and guaranteed by the state and the rule of law. And the problem is, as, as, as for me, is that uh, 
the European Union, the idea of united Europe, got used to rather liberty, which has been guaranteed for decades by peace established on the continent as the main outcome of the Second World War, and appeared that it's not really prepared to embrace freedom when the moment came, the moment of realpolitik. And I'm also very tempted to use here very obvious uh, reference, of course, famous expression by Erich Fromm, the escape from freedom, right? So in this sense, I think that uh, what we have been observing in Europe during the last decades, but especially during the last months after the, uh, after the February 24th, uh, when the full-scale invasion started, it was a kind of an, a process of escaping from freedom when it, for Europe, it somehow became even psychologically problematic to embrace freedom and to accept it. So uh, the historical moment that I just mentioned today that the war presents and challenges us with is because free Europe today is at stake. We still are somehow used to these ideas that this war is somebody else's war taking place somewhere in the pe European peripheries, though not being constant, really aware that this is an unbelievable, unthinkable European continental war of an unprecedented scale. So this escape from freedom has, uh, I think, uh, several political reasons. And uh, first of all, I think this is very much connected to the modus operandi of the European Union. Because uh, as we observe it today, the dominant type of uh, the governmentality or the type of governance of the European Union is basically uh, externalizing problems beyond the European wall, pushing conflicts, problems to the outside, to the peripheries in order to keep the interior safe. And again, I have to remind you that I'm speaking from the from the other side of the European world. So as a result of this uh, gated community strategy, in a way, was not the idea to solve conflicts, but just to border conflicts, right? to push them to the outside. So as an, effectively, we have the situation in which European Union today is being surrounded by a belt of wars in its so-called peripheries, in its east, as well as in its south, which unavoidably is accompanied with a huge influx of migrants and escapers from different warfares. And this modus operandi somehow defined also a kind of a political lifestyle in the Union, uh, which is whenever political cultures and countries in the EU face some type of ideological polarization, discontent, fear, or anger, those strong political emotions, right, which really do define our lives. A typical strategy for that matter is just to go quickly back to the norm, to business as usual, to some type of neutrality, to consensus that can save us from those horrible political extremes, quote unquote. So all in all, it appears that the United Europe is very much focused on some centrist normality, on neutrality. So what, the way how it appears from the outside is rather a kind of a self-satisfied bubble, which provides some illusionary protection from being disturbed in an unpleasant manner, a kind of a sanctuary from the unbearable which is usually taking place somewhere else, a kind of an Elysium. And by the way, just a side note, that is exactly the reason why the EU has been constantly haunted by right-wing populism, including the, the Netherlands, right? And also, by the way, this neutrality, this uh, consensus sort of approach also defines a typical attitude of today towards Ukrainian voices at war. Because uh, usually uh, what 
we also experienced personally and institutionally from the side of the Western media and pretty often different institutional representatives of the cultural field and sphere in the West is somehow that we are not allowed to fully express our emotions, our strong emotions, as if the West is somehow expecting some protection from this full expression of truth, uh, expecting some limitation of strong emotions like fury, pain, rage, or anger, as if this full expression would deprive those who are speaking out of validity or rationality. So the premise of this sort of neutral approach is that the war should be judged from this neutral position. So only from that point of view, we, we can judge it really true. But another problem that this escape from freedom really took a pretty practical embodiment in a way was basically in the context of and in the aftermath of the Ukrainian Maidan in 2014. As you know, the war itself, the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the occupation of Ukrainian territories basically started eight years ago. So uh, Maidan as such was, uh, we can call it the last European revolution so far. And it was actually the biggest chance ever for Europe at large, but uh, for, for many obvious reasons, right? Because Maidan as a protest, as a revolution was fundamentally European. It basically dragged European Union back to its roots when everybody understood that such values as democracy, freedom, justice are basic needs for our survival. But it challenged also the European Union in a way because of its existence, because as such, Maidan also demanded a different Europe, a more inclusive Europe, a more fulfilled European Union. But uh, this was something that European Union was not ready to accept, was not ready to incorporate the revolutionary outcomes into its own modus operandi. So, uh, Maidan actually transformed the EU flag into Euro, into revolutionary flag. But that was too much for the European Union. Dying on the EU flag? Oh, come on. European Union was much more comfortable when the European flag has been actually burned down, as it's pretty often the case in the at the demonstrations in different uh, European capitals, as you know. So that's why Maidan as a revolution was somehow distant, distanced from the union as such. It was too disturbing for, for the uh, way European Union has been functioning. And another political reason for this escape of freedom from the side of the European Union is actually colonial legacy of Europe, which effectively has been repressed rather to the past and uh, not applied to the present day, to the moment of today, because uh, it also would mean that we have to think in colonial and neo-colonial terms, also applied to the other parts of Europe, like Euro European East. So it also showed that European Union is even incapable to recognize colonialism, to so to say, next to its own nose. Though European Union as a project is basically a project of decolonization, because uh, that was a kind of a very natural way out, both for empires, for former empires and for former colonies, mostly in the east and in the south of Europe, to enter some different type of integration. And also inability to recognize that still on the European continent, we actually have an elephant in the room, a huge, unbelievably big empire, the Russian one, which has been conducting colonial wars basically after the start, after the end of the Soviet Union, since 1991. But Europe actually preferred to think of itself differently. So since uh, 
2014, it has actually just been ignoring the, the obvious colonial war, colonial grabs and occupation of uh, Ukrainian territory. And the same what happened in Georgia in 2000, 2008. And also this, uh, this kind of attitude towards the colonized is also actually defining this constant food dragging and delays with regards to weaponry supplies to Ukraine nowadays, which is so much urgently uh, needed. Because uh, as we know also from the colonial history, that the colonized are actually not supposed to be armed as they are deprived of the real agency, of the real subjectivity. They are not supposed to resist and to fight for liberation. It's only the colonizers who are allowed to be armed and weaponized. But this West is divide is actually, and this specific uh, attitude towards the East, especially the post-Soviet East, from the European metropolis, so to say, is basically also a colonial attitude because it has been like usually a kind of a common sense that uh, it is usually Russia that is in charge of that whole space, right? And this uh, colonial attitude presupposes that basically we have two Europes. One Europe, which is civilized, a proper one, the Western one. And on the other hand, you have just some Second-hand Europe, which is not really Europe, right? It's just some barbaric uh, wreckages of some empires that we don't want to associate us with. And this inability to recognize Europe's own colonialism in the present also contributed to inability to recognize Russian fascism. Because R Russian state fascism, which actually has been domesticated by Western capital and Western politics to the extent that it became uncomfortable to publicly denounce it because it was exactly the Western financial and political elites who helped to, to raise this Russian fascist dictatorial regime through pumping their assets into Russian mafia capitalism. And by the way, still today, European consumers are paying for Russian fossil fuels, and in this way are financing this fascist war. But this is totally obvious. It, and the, the, the paradox here is that it is openly said, has been openly said by the aggressor himself, that the other nation doesn't exist and shouldn't exist, that uh, they have a genocidal purpose to eliminate Ukrainians as such, and they have also a state machine that is ready to execute these genocidal fantasies and exterminate Ukrainians for, for that matter. Because this is so obvious and so much present in front of our eyes globally that somehow this pretty simple fact is usually being omitted in the discussions in the international public sphere which is actually the specificity of this war, if we think about this really seriously. Because unlike most of the recent warfare conflicts of the last decades, this war is not the war between two countries. This war is not even the war between two armies. And this war is also not the war between the army and the insurgency, right? This war is actually the war of one country's military against the other country's people. And that, that is exactly what makes it just because we are supposed not to exist in the aggressor's, in the aggressor's mind. So I think to wrap it up that uh, this uh, European, indeed continental war, which is basically aimed and for that matter, this type of lexicon has been used, like denazification, genocide, and so on, uh, aimed at disruption the European institutional order, which ensured the European peace for decades and established Europe as we know it today. But that, I think, the most tragic uh, moment of today, really a kind of a Chamberlain moment, 
Uh, and perhaps the biggest blow of to freedom that in we experienced so far is that everybody before February 24th understood clearly what is going to happen. We were told this by different administrations, the American one foremost, on an everyday basis. But still, European countries agreed. And I think that this is the most scandalous moment when we really seriously think about freedom today, that European countries in general somehow agreed in principle and accepted in advance that today in the 21st century, an independent, sovereign country can be militarily occupied and deprived of its statehood. Everybody knew that 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 was going to happen. And somehow, European countries, in spite of all historical parallels that we are super aware of, somehow they agreed and decided that they could get along with this in, in, in today's world. Basically, on a smaller scale, that's exactly what happened in, in 2014. And now, in the global political public discussion, if we really analyze it from this point of view, this whole public discussion, which is usually covered by the concerns uh, with regards to uh, escalation and so on, which is totally understandable, of course. But if we think from this point of view, we can clearly see that this discussion is basically, and the framework of it, is basically very much about how to secure the conditions in which it is only Ukrainians who are being sacrificed, who are exposed to attacks, and who are basically foredoomed to die. And I find this absolutely despicable and obnoxious if we really think about some ethics and uh, freedom today. So in this sense, I, to, to, to finish with, I would say that if Ukraine wins, Europe for sure will be more free and more peaceful. But if Ukraine loses, there would be neither Europe, nor freedom, nor peace, at least in the, in the form that we know them today. So if European Union really thinks of its future in, under such harsh circumstances, and uh, the, 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 the outcome is really, uh, and the, the reason is very simple, that uh, when, we are, when we are challenged by a new type of fascism, it's just this time it's coming from Europe's east. It's impossible to trade with it. It's impossible to compromise with it. It's impossible to make concessions to it. The only way to win, you have to fight for it, against it. Otherwise, we all lose. So I put comma here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Fazil, for this very broad analysis uh, of the situation. And I think you uh, you put it very intelligent and sharp. Uh, but I have to ask you, you have been uh, warning us for decades uh, for this war to happen. How angry are you? Oh. I mean, it's... Um I think, you know, like psychologically speaking, you have different stages, how you uh, adjust yourself to the, this kind of situation. But uh, I think that in, in this case, uh, being angry is not a productive way to tackle this situation. I think that uh, the, the challenges that we face are so huge that we have, in a way, even to trespass ourselves in order to find some possible solutions, in order in order to really solve them. Otherwise, I think we are really uh, in a absolutely unbelievable problematic uh, situation. That uh, yeah, because the problem here, you know, because angry uh, usually being angry appears at the very beginning, right? So uh, I lived uh, through too much in order to still be uh, be angry. But the biggest problem, I would say, is that. Uh, of today is that we don't actually know 
whether what we have right now is a prelude or is a finale. Yeah. And if we are really thinking about some po- positive future, we have all together to deploy all the means possible in order to make it a really a finale. Yes, because that's the other thing you said. It's not a war against Ukraine. It's a war against Europe, actually. Um, while we might not realize it all the time. Um, we will talk about this and, and the other points you made. And I want to introduce my two other guests of tonight. Um, Kisha Hexter, working as an EU and NATO correspondent for the NOS, the Dutch Public Broadcast. She is also a former Russia correspondent and was until recently reporting from Ukraine. Welcome. Come sit here with me. Um, and I will also introduce Sheng Schreie, a writer and a specialist on Russian art. Welcome to you both. Yes. So, um, Vasil has given an impressive lecture, I think. Um, is there something that you took out of it right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it feels a bit strange to sit with my back to you, you uh, can, uh, Vasil. You can, uh, Hi, yeah. on the screen right there. Yeah. I don't know if you can see us, but uh, it's nice meeting you. Jakuyu, um, thank you so much for your very inspiring and... Yeah, great lecture. I was really moved by it. And there are several things. I, I made a lot of notes. Um, I don't know where to start, actually. Maybe best to start in 2014. Uh, I was covering also uh, the from, from Donetsk when the war started there. And um, it has always struck me, um, you were probably on Maidan when the uh, EU representatives were there telling you never to let you down, never to let Ukraine down. And of course, everybody knows what happened afterwards. And I think um, people in Brussels still f- carry this with them, this, uh, this moment of letting your country down. So this is very deep, um, I, th- I think, in the conscience of many people. Although in the following up, you would say a business went on as usual, nothing really happened, as you were saying. Um, you were forgotten, more or less, yeah, by, by Brussels. So, um, as you were saying, ignoring the obvious, the things that were going on in your country, I think that was very well said. I, 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 I think this is something that is um, very, that people are very much aware of these days. The, um, the thing, second thing that struck me uh, when, when listening to you is that uh, the EU still maybe is not ready to act as a geopolitical power, if I can say this as a sort of translation of what you've been saying. Um, I think what's really striking me in Brussels, I've been working there for over a year now, and of course everything changed from February uh, quite radically, uh, in a way that many people would have never uh, thought possible. Um, What really striking me is that things are changing and that people are getting more used maybe to the idea of becoming a geopolitical power. And what is especially interesting for me from your lecture is that you are saying that the EU is acting from a sort of neutrality perspective. And I think that's very uh, well said. Um, I think what you see clearly within the European Union now is the debate uh, between more eastern part of the European Union, the the Baltic countries, Poland, the ones that are, uh, in your words, maybe more emotionally, um, versus the people like in... um, in the, in, in, in the Netherlands, our prime minister is in Kiev today. Maybe you, you heard this, yeah. So I would say he's quite uh, somebody to be a representative. Yeah, let's, let's focus on that for Representative of the moment. neutrality. Yeah. yeah. Why is he there? Why is he there? <laughs> um, he, I don't know. He's, uh, he finally found a, found a time slot probably in his busy schedule because I think he's one of the last leaders to EU visit. leaders to arrive. Yeah, I would, I would say he's quite a... Uh, a very well representative of this neutrality um, idea yeah. within the European Union. But I, what I found more uh, very interesting, and I, I will I will stop talking because <laughs> it's been too long already. What I find very interesting is that you see this uh, paradigm paradigm shifting. I would say within the EU, people are finally more and more listening to what's coming from this eastern uh, part of the EU. And I think it's very important that our prime minister uh, is there and that he can see 
what is going on with his own eyes or what has been going on with his own eyes and hopefully this will change also maybe part of the of the attitude. Uh, finally, I would say that um, if you are talking about the EU as a geopolitical power, one that should weaponize your country, I would say that uh, that is what is quite uh, striking for me. Um, the EU is, of course, not a, uh, a union um, which can provide weapons. They do provide weapons now, over two billion um, in, in worse of weapons have, have been set from this so-called uh, Orwellian peace fund. But of course the EU in the end is, uh, is nothing without NATO. So it's nothing without the US and this is the, maybe the painful truth, mm -hmm. but this is I think what, what, um, what, what I want to mention. Yeah. And then I made a lot of notes, but I will. <laughs> we will get into that uh, yes. later. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Sheng, do you have something to comment? Yes, well, firstly, um, Vasil, I was also very impressed um, and emotionalized by your, uh, by your lecture. Um, um, maybe as a comment uh, to start with on, on the subject of neutrality, um, it's good maybe to remember that um, this problem of neutrality is not a new problem when facing fascism. And just everybody will know this, uh, the, the Dutch people in this hall, that uh, Holland stayed a neutral country against uh, fascist Germany even after uh, the war started and uh, the, the Nazis invaded Poland. And only, you know, when our own country was invaded, um, this... Uh, uh, Something changed. Yes, this stupidity, um, you know, uh, was shaken off. Um, um, so it's it, it's a kind of historical stupidity, you could call that. It's also something which is very paradoxically linked to the idea of democracy. Because, and I think that's why it was so interesting that you started your lecture with this these um, these two concepts. Of, of liberty, of freedom and liberty, right? The, 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 the very philosophical one, the, the broad concept of liberty, which feeds the much smaller, specialized, compartmentalized concept of liberty um, that we have encoded in our laws, for example. And one of the things is that democracy, um, because it acknowledges the idea that is never a, a complete ideological unity, that there will always be discourse, that there will always be a, a variety of concepts of what justice is, what liberty is, and that um, the, the, the reason why democracy sometimes functions so very well is the same exact reason why it is so badly um, um, organized to um, confront its main threat, which is fascism. And fascism, for example, it has the, um, the, the great um, value or the, the, the strength of fascism is that there is no discourse, of course. There is no discussion. There's only one ideology. There's only one track you know, that society should go. So um, for that reason, fascism, fascism, fascism is very well prepared for this battle against democracy. So it is, it is also something that is ingrained within the whole concept of democracy, but it's the reason the more that people like you um, remind us that there is um, a line, yeah, a line somewhere. to be crossed and that we should be aware of that. And it is difficult to make that um, uh, you know, to, to go over from the idea, okay, that we should all be in dialogue with each other, that we should listen to the other party, because that was, you know, more or less the strategy that we had with Russia. You know, it was not that we did not recognize that Putin was a, a, a dictator or, you know, a, um, or becoming a dictator, but that the idea of, you know, a democratic approach, that you listen, you go into you know, um, exchange with each other, and then, you know, the magic will happen. Until it doesn't, of course, and in this uh, particular moment, of course, we were, again, too late. Yes, Fezel, I'm very curious how you see um, 
the thing that Sheng just just said about democracy not being equipped enough to to respond quickly to fascist threats, because I think that also linked to what you said about neutrality feeding the the extreme right wing parties within the European Union. Right. Well, uh, uh, I think that democracy can be also an armed one, right? As a, an armed, as a armed one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so uh, I totally understand this uh, kind of inner um, uh, dichotomy that you have to listen to everybody, and not to exclude uh, other voices. Uh, that is uh, that is totally understandable. But the problem is that basically, I think um, when when we just when we sort of project this uh, problematic field uh, onto. European politics, right, of the of the last decade or decades. <clears throat> I think the uh, problem uh, partly has been uh, that um, somehow there was a kind of an uh, a priori approach, especially uh, after eighty nine uh, range of the revolutions in the former socialist bloc, right, and especially also after the crash of the USSR, uh, this kind of approach that, uh, of course, coming from the West, right, from the Western Europe, that we got it right, that we know how the things should evolve, right? that it was this kind of uh, uh, self-imposed illusion that, uh, uh, which was uh, in a pretty vulgar, as for me, manner in terms of philosophical concepts, um, put yes. by Fukuyama about the end of history, right? But somehow the, the, that was an idea that somehow waiting for the East to catch up with us, right? That uh, we are like on the uh, this, uh, I think it was also Habermas who uh, coined the term the revolution, right? Like this catching up revolution that we have just to be fast enough in order to, to put, to take the same track as the West already did, right, and uh, somehow catch up with the West. Uh, though I think that was totally uh, uh, a total mistake because uh, it appears that actually uh, Eastern Europe is different, but not for that reason that the West was thinking about, right, but also exactly also because of, uh, of uh, the West's colonial past to, to, to a great extent. Let's not forget that the Second World War was a Germany's colonial war, right? It was just, uh, the idea was just uh, that uh, uh, these colonies, uh, well, Ukraine in particular, uh, were, were, were just situated in, on the European continent, but not on, uh, on other continents, right? Unlike during uh, maritime uh, empires. So I think that this was one of the reasons why, uh, why, uh, why the European Union led itself into this uh, it, into this deadlock. Yes. And the other reason was this um, kind of, as for me, a totally anti-political approach um, based only on economy. So, so to say, economism, right? Pure economism. Like this wandel durch handel, like this kind of uh, change through trade, that, uh, that like this kind of, again, very... Uh, very naive idea that uh, that capitalism or what is usually called free market can solve all our issues. That we don't need political approaches for that matter. It's only about economy. That uh, that like these trickle down ideas. I think this uh, also uh, this kind of uh, hubris, so to say, coming from the West after the crash of the socialist bloc and this. Uh, economist uh, sort of uh, focus uh, played uh, this double role in which uh, yeah. that, that the West found itself in such a deadline. The idea that we don't need politics anymore because we have economics and that will solve everything. I want to go back a little bit to the division between the, the Western part of Europe and the Eastern part of Europe because we, we've already mentioned that a few times. Um, you just said that the European Union is of course not a, 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 a military power but it's a political power, but we see that they give weapons in money. Um, and you also see there a difference between the Western part of Europe and the Eastern part of Europe. What do you think of that? 
Um, I think it's as, as, as Vasil was mentioning that, uh, of course, this eastern part of uh, the European Union has been warning for this Wander uh, durch Handel and everything already for uh, over a decade. And they were always um, more or less, uh, well, Prepares, it's, it's a bit harsh to say laughed at, but maybe it comes down to that. Yeah, people were not ready to, to believe that what was being said in Tallinn was maybe actually right. And I think, the, I don't know how you look upon this, uh, yes. Sheng, but I think that this is a bit is a bit changing by now. It's still, um, it's still maybe not the, um, uh, the, the vast majority of EU leaders that are ready to accept this. But, uh, but this is because, of course, they're very, they're very much afraid of this, uh, this what, what Fazil is also mentioning about what is the result of the, economic, uh, the economics that they have been following so far. I mean, I think what is on the EU leaders' minds right now most is, uh, is the, the fright of what is uh, waiting for us in the European Union this coming winter. There's a really a panic in, uh, About the gas. in, of yeah. course, yeah, all over different countries, uh, also in Brussels. And uh, on, on one hand, it's also very, um, you know, it, it's, it must be quite difficult for Fasil to realize that people are thinking about what's happening to our to countries, me, yeah. what's, what's happening to our union, and that our minds are no uh, longer with Ukraine all the time. On the other hand, people are saying uh, out loud, as long as it takes, we're going to support Ukraine. But I don't know what it will be in uh, one year, two years, three years, as uh, Vasil was mentioning. Is this uh, the prelude or is it the final? Yeah. You know, this is what is going, really going to, to test uh, the Euro European Union. Yeah, so, so is the Western part of the, the EU being held hostage um, on an economic level in this war? Um, you mean... The Western part of the European Union uh, held hostage by... Um, by the economic uh, repression of Russia that, that comes through the, the gas, maybe. That we don't want oh, to interfere in this war because our countries will be cut off. Well, um, obviously this plays a major role in, uh, in political decisions. Um, but in, in principle, um, yeah, the whole energy... Um, uh, factor in this conflict is also um, it has it's to do with, with um, uh, many dynamics but first and foremost of course with our reluctance to um, uh, much earlier attack the whole problem of the um, uh, energy um, uh, yes, uh, uh, the, yeah, dependence and, uh, and dependence and in general the energy transition right mm -hmm. um, so this is another um, problem, you know, that we did not want to solve. We knew it was very problematic from a variety of reasons, eh? the political reasons, uh, the um, of, uh, geopolitical reasons, but also, of course, the environmental reasons. And we could see it coming We could from see this afar. coming, yes. and everybody knew that it was coming, and everybody knew that this... And the Baltics did see it coming, and, they, and they already prepared for it. You know, this is also what's really a big difference between... Uh, the uh, of course. Um, and also on the subject of handel und wandel versus um, confrontation, I think one of the problems was that um, certainly 15 or 20 years ago, the idea of handel und wandel was not such a bad idea, I think, only it, it needs to be accompanied by a serious... Um, uh, engagement also on the pol uh, political and cultural and cultural level uh, uh, but it was very opportunistic you know it was only the idea oh if we make money then the ideological miracle will happen and of course that's not how it goes you know you it, it's only one of the um, the instruments that you have and it needs to be accompanied by a serious engagement and one of the things that happened also with you know what I would call the more uh, progressive uh, or moderate uh, parts within the the Russian elites uh, but also in other Eastern European countries those inside the European and outside is that in general there is 
in enormous frustration and um, a, a lack of uh, feeling um, that they are acknowledged, right, uh, by the West uh, on, a, on a political and cultural level. And um, this fed also in, in frustration that, for example, uh, led to um, uh, the political situation in Hungary or the political situation in, in Poland, and which in, in many uh, instances of, is very problematic to the union itself. So it's this, um, what I would call, a, a opportunistic approach that um, has done a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. um, and also, okay, we want to have the benefits of the union and we want to have the benefits of talking to Russia and to talking to Eastern European countries, but we do not really want to invest. And we do not want to invest culturally and we do not want to invest politically. And um, so I do not completely uh, want to throw away the idea of handel und wandel, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a moderate in that, but uh, it, it can only work if it is accompanied by much more than that. Yeah. Kizia, okay. yeah, you said that there was something changing now in the, the perception of also the Eastern European uh, countries that were already warning for this and that they're, they're catching up, the Western parts. Do you have maybe some examples of that? Are we moving um. forward? In any way? Yeah, I, I, well, um, we were talking about the uh, energy dependency of uh, of the Western countries. Of course, the Eastern European countries have been really investing in uh, getting independent and for maybe the past few years, uh, and they are now in a position to that they are completely independent. And this is something I would say that the the Western European countries are now uh, jealous of or uh, are blaming themselves maybe for. And it's not only about uh, about the energy, of course. It's also about ramping inflation. That's that's causing a lot of politicians now really big uh, big problems for re-election for for everything. Um, I'm thinking, trying to think of another example that is um, that comes to my mind about how the change of influence within the European Union. Um, it's also maybe if you go to the EU candidacy of your country of Ukraine and um, of Moldova that you can see now within the Union already the, the thinking, the, the shift of how to how this will put, how this will uh, relate to the focus. Uh, mostly it was only about Berlin and France taking uh, the big decisions. Now, uh, I, th I, I think it's, it's maybe a bit premature, but you can see the early signs of this changes within the EU. But uh, yeah, it's still, on the other hand, you see um, people hoping that it will all go away somehow. And still. they, huh? Still. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm. I'm afraid so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you, so too, yeah. Huh? yeah, I think so too. Yeah. This is still this this idea. So, you know. Um, okay, we now give a lot of weapons. We give some money, and then it and then should be it, over. It will just yeah. easily uh, fade away. You know, like um, you know, a bad ghost uh, or something like that. And then we will wake up tomorrow, and you know, the yeah. nightmare uh, is over. Yeah. And you, yeah, you really note. I really notice this if I talk to diplomats or to politicians uh, on a background level. I ask it because all of it's like a mantra within the European Union that people are all saying: uh, Putin cannot win this war. But if you ask somebody, okay, what does it actually mean, Putin cannot win this war? What does it mean? Does Ukraine get to get back to uh, the, um, the borders of uh, tw before 21st of February, 24th, or was it in 2014? They have no idea. So it's just uh, like a mantra, like the same thing, as long as it takes. What is this, as long as it takes? Nobody knows. It can be, uh, and, and you see it clear, clearly also that uh, the EU, EU managed to get uh, six... Uh, packets of sanctions within a few months, but it's clear now that what's what's going to be next, it's going to be much more difficult. And when you say, okay, but the war maybe has just started, nobody knows what's going to be the seventh, the eighth, the ninth yeah. packet, nobody knows. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's clear that there was a quick reaction in the beginning, super quick. Um, if, you, if you ask people in Brussels who have been working there for ages, they say we have never imagined that they would react in such a quick way, but it's now like uh, a stand, stand still. 
Is that an English word? Yeah, that's not yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. not yeah. very uplifting. Um, Fazil, we have, of course, as you mentioned, the, the sanctions and the EU membership. Um, are those things that are giving a little hope? Uh, <laughs> you know, it reminds me, it's like a kind of um, deja vu because uh, we were talking about more or less the same things uh, after Maidan in 2014 and somehow, um, you know, the problem is that uh, now these decisions uh, sort of were implemented or uh, legally, but uh, at the same, and they come as a surprise. So uh, it has been, it should have been already the case long, long ago. And that's the problem for me that actually for some strange reason, this is really, I mean, uh, the, I'm still wondering myself somehow that the EU uh, just is uh, somehow incapable to act ahead. It, to think it ahead always to reacts. Act ahead. Right? Yeah. This is really, if you think about this, like from inside even, this is really strange. It cannot act ahead like preventing something from happening. It just reacts to what already has happened, right? I mean, there are, of course, uh, like exceptions. Uh, maybe I'm uh, like a bit exaggerating, but I mean, in principle, when it comes to, or for instance, take this Nord Stream 2. Like Germany, till the start of the war, on the fir very first day, was not ready to, to tell openly that they would stop this project, right? I mean... That's uh, somehow still coping like what uh, our colleagues described. That there is still this idea that somehow it will solve by uh, will be solved by itself because it's somewhere else. But uh, you know, I mean, the, even if you think of this, uh, perhaps um, perhaps it's also because uh, I mean there are many many reasons reasons for that. Because uh, obviously, if you uh, th this is very much a generational issue, I would say. Because if you take the, the 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 people who are now in uh, in in power in the in the European governments, right? Uh, they 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 don't have uh, like uh, the experience of what is really a war. They can only imagine, or like it's anyways for them, it's something on the screens. Like it was also for 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 Ukrainians also for almost uh, like uh, thirty years, right? So they they, they are not ready to respond to these challenges because they are too big, really, too big. But on the other hand, I think uh, this is also somehow um, defined but, uh, but, uh, that, uh, by the, the kind of uh, past imagination. Like uh, people, especially like in Germany or like in Central Europe, let's say, they, they, they were thinking with regards to like occupied Crimea or Donbass, that uh, we can actually get along because maybe it's something like similar to what uh, GDR was, like Eastern Germany was. They couldn't even imagine what life under occupation means. Yeah, there when it comes to fascism, you know, because what, what uh, the, the, there are filtration camps that you cannot eat because you have to work like to, to gather corpse on this. I mean, all the atrocities that they don't have that you, uh, that all the media are now full with, right? But they, they couldn't even imagine themselves how come that, uh, that this is a kind of a repetition of the, of the, of the Second World War. And I, thi uh, I think still people in the European Union are not really aware of the real scale of this war. They still think that uh, usually it's referred in the media as crisis in Ukraine or war in Ukraine. They don't even call this uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. But if you think uh, of, of, of the countries which are involved already, right, the war is being uh, conducted from several territories against Ukraine. Right? It's uh, Russian Federation itself. It's occupied Belarus. It's also Transistria, which is Moldovian occupied territory. Right. It's uh, it's also Syria, because we also have Syrian mercenaries who are uh, who are uh, uh, on the front line from the from the Russian side. Or think of the uh, think of the, there are all, there already are three seas from which the war is being conducted, the Baltic one, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, right, from which uh, Russia pretty often launches its uh, its uh, flight. Uh, jet flights uh, attack. So the, the whole Baltic region has been uh, reshaped. 
Sweden and Finland joined NATO, NATO, right? The whole east of Europe has been totally reshaped, um, reshaped by, by, by this. And if you take uh, the, the Black Sea region, Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, already mentioned Moldova, or on the other side, uh, you have more than 50 countries involved in helping Ukraine within the so-called Rammstein format, right? So it's unbelievable scale already. It's a very multidimensional war. Yeah. It has so many levels. And people in Europe still think that this is something somewhere in the east of Ukraine. This is totally misleading, I mean, practically speaking. Kisia, do you uh, think that the European Union grasps how big it is? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, if you say Ramstein Group, uh, it's it's all EU nations. Yeah, so yeah. it's 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 impossible to um, not to see what is going on. I would say if uh, yeah, so it might only take some time to get used to getting rid of the neutrality and yeah. I don't know how you look yeah. upon this. Well, I think. Um, um, Although um, it maybe is not enough, but I think in principle, uh, uh, the war is felt everywhere, yeah. on every aspect of political life, on every aspect of economical life. Um, so yeah, there is no politician or, or uh, civil servant that I speak with uh, on any level that is not in a way uh, already involved. Uh, which not to say that it is enough, but um, yeah, there, there is, I think, uh, now this awareness that it is a historical uh, war with historical consequences. Um, um, and yeah, if I can add maybe something about this uh, uh, question of, you know, Putin can already uh, cannot lose this war, or cannot win this war, um, uh, that that might be. Um, a wrong conception, but I do think, in a way, that uh, the West can win this war, and that it's important to acknowledge this. You know, it's not to that we should be lazy or be, um, you know, um, e enormously um, content with ourselves. But I do think that we can win this war, and uh, I also do think that Putin made an historical stupidity um, also for his own country, for his own people, um, uh, because um, with all you know, their military might, and of course the, this is enormous, and they are certainly able to um, wreak enormous havoc and, and bring enormous destruction uh, not only to Ukraine, uh, certainly, uh, they have this ability, but at the same time, Russia is certainly not a, a power that cannot be beaten. You know, it is very divided internally. It is weak. The whole leadership are, uh, are uh, 70 plus uh, <laughs> corrupt figures. Their whole ideology is uh, corrupt and opportunistic. And in, in that particular case, they are not, you know, like the fascist threat, who really were extremely believing in their own mm. uh, ideological ideas. Um, maybe for the exam with the exemption of Putin, I cannot really judge that. But there is an enormous amount of, of op opportunism and uh, corruption, of course, in Russia. This is no news. And, um, and it's also, of course, again, connected with the whole a question of energy, um, uh, and if I can um, imagine that this is for the Ukrainians already a, right, uh, an abstract story. Uh, the bombs are landing on your heads, and we are talking about you know a, a, a ten-year uh, horizon for uh, an, an energy um, uh, transition. But still, we have to see these these things into connection with each other, and. If we see them in, in connection, so the military um, war with the energy war and the political war, then we can win. Uh, and this is the way that we 
uh, yeah, in, in totality should look at it. But how, how do you see we? How do you, would you define yeah, we? Okay. <laughs> because, uh, no, no, but yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, I'm a bit more skeptical maybe on mm -hmm. this side if you look at what's going on in China and in India, the south of south, Southern America, you know, we are, who, who is going to win this war if you say we as well, the West? Yeah, at least we as the West, um, in, in order to, to beat Putinism. Mm. Um, uh, I don't say that this will be easy, but it's good to have a perspective and to understand what is necessary for that. Because otherwise, it would, you know, from the Western perspective, just be, okay, it's kind of eternal uh, dump. Um, um, and um, we need to have this strategy and a perspective, what it means to win. And very often I see there is no clarity uh, about what that means. Uh, um, but it means to defeat Putinism, I think. I will um, uh, ask one last question about this topic because we are short on time. But I think one of the things that is also uh, a part of this is the values that you mentioned, like democracy and freedom and what it means to us. And I think the idea is now that the European Union is not able enough to define those values and to remember, like you said, it's a mantra from the past. This war will not go on again like the Second World War. Have we forgotten how to fill in these concepts? Are we strong enough to say this is what democracy means, this is what freedom means to us? And we will fight for it, maybe. Yeah, I always find it quite um, moving that if I talk to Ukrainian friends, they say that, uh, this is what I want to ask you as well, Vasil, they say, um, we are used that in the end, we are the ones fighting for ourselves. We are not uh, counting on you to support us. And this is always very, uh, yeah, it's really sad. It's really sad, yeah. But uh, I hear it a lot from, uh, from my friends. They say, we are used to this situation and we have to do it. We are the ones fighting. Maybe you don't realize it for your values, but this is what we do. So I don't know if you feel any support at all. You are saying, of course, uh, it's not enough. There should be more. But in, in what way do you feel supported at this moment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, th this is super valuable. I wouldn't underestimate it because uh, without that, uh, we wouldn't exist at the moment, right? I mean, this is obvious, uh, practical, uh, practical reality. But um, um, I would rather broaden these uh, these perspectives that you just outlined because, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I agree that uh, this is also somehow. Uh, like fighting for, 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 for other values and that we are like usually do this ourselves. But you know, this, um, I just have to say, because this is very much uh, re re reminds me of, uh, of uh, the revolutionary situation on Maidan, on the square, like literally and metaphorically, because it's basically, uh, you also had this situation at the very end of this, uh, when, when already uh, violence uh, started and these uh, violent clashes with the police um, on in the center of the city, but uh, so basically, as the, at the uh, some last days, you basically had uh, some amount of people who were ready to stay till the end uh, and to protect the square with their own bodies. And actually, I I was all the time on my of course, but uh, and I w I wouldn't say that there were. Uh, so many of them. So it's also with regards to what, uh, how the question was posed, that uh, whether we are ready to fight with, for these values. So, I mean, that uh, somehow uh, you, you basically, of course, you have to be ready uh, to, uh, uh, to fight and to stay uh, till, uh, till the end, right, if you are really committed to the cause. But uh, I wouldn't say that it demands like really uh, masses and masses and masses of uh, people from uh, from everywhere. Of course, it was a mass movement across the country, right? But at, at a crucial moment, it also, let's not forget that uh, uh, this is also about the readiness of, uh, of some countries, right? I mean, uh, think of uh, if, for instance, uh, Hitler wasn't allowed, wasn't allowed to take Sudetenland. We wouldn't have the Second World War, perhaps, right? 
I mean, it's also not uh, that all the like all the Ramstein countries have to come here and fight. No, no, no. But let's let's also. I mean, if not Great Britain in the, during the thirties, uh, right? We would we would be living in a different world, uh, right? So I mean, it's not really. So of course, this international solidarity is crucial. I, I am strong believer in in internationalism. There is no doubt about that. And for that matter, I think that the European Union is one of the uh, best political ideas uh, ever, right? Because of this embodiment of this internationalist idea, unprecedented one. But at the same time, uh, it's also sometimes it depends on certain amount of people who are really ready. <laughs> so and that is a recipe to win. Because come on, guys, we are not we cannot allow a fossil fuel oligarch with a fascist ideology to destroy us. This is ridiculous. Well, thank you for those words. And I will go to the questions in the audience uh, in a little bit, but there's one more topic that I want to address with the three of you, and that is arts and culture, because um, it might seem futile, maybe, or um, unnecessary, but uh, democracy is also, for a large part, made of artists who are free to make what they want and to express um, uh, feelings against regimes or for regimes, and it's a really important part of uh, of every uh, state and every democracy. Um, so, Sheng, this is your part of expertise, of course. Yes. Um, can you tell us something about uh, what you mean if you say Russian art and culture? Because I understood that you yeah, have that, a that's a problematic term. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, very much. Um, yeah, let me first make the connection maybe with politics, I think, because I already mentioned that one of the problems of this whole handel und wandel uh, strategy of confronting Russia was that it was not accompanied by a serious political and cultural and societal uh, effort, right? So, although... I I, um, I don't have any grandiose ideas about the value of culture in you know um, um, uh, making democracy uh, in a, in, a, in a, you know um, uh, easily or so you know I, I don't we, we should not ex exaggerate uh, the political effectiveness of culture but it is something else that you do you know, through a cultural investment, and that is acknowledging um, one of the greatest values of democracy, maybe its, its um, core value, that of diversity and... Uh, um, freedom uh, of expression. Yeah, freedom of uh, ex expression. So in, in doing that, in showing that, in establishing those cultural connections, you... you you show what what it means to be democratic instead of talking about it <laughs> so in in that particular perspective i think it's very important and also uh, this 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 idea of acknowledging the other because one of the problems in general uh, um, of how the west engages with the east in, in general, is this lack of engagement and this lack of acknowledgement. And I think you mentioned it in, in various parts of your, um, of your lecture, uh, this idea that we do not take Eastern Europe uh, completely serious, that we do not com completely want to engage with it. Uh, and I think this is true. Uh, and it's very human, of course, in a way, but uh, that doesn't mean that's a good thing. And, and uh, it is something that we didn't do enough. So, um, uh, and this counts for uh, how we um, encountered uh, Eastern Europe within the European Union, but also outside. And as I mentioned before, also how we encountered with, with Russia, because I do not see Russia as an internal evil in the world. Um, uh, but uh, some things really went wrong, also in the way, of course, in how we engage with Russia. So, um, and you know, um, but yeah, let me finish <laughs> it here. Um, and one of the things that I was busy with already before the war started um, was uh, enlarging my research, which was mainly always focused on Moscow and Petersburg, into Kiev and Kharkiv. Uh, and the, the cultural sphere um, in Ukraine, which was incredibly 
difficult also because in you know in Dutch but I think mostly in Western European um, uh, conscience um, you know Ukraine was you know this was something and it belonged to Russia right it's just one big blob and uh, yes uh, it could be interesting but the idea that um, this is a distinctive phenomenon um, that was just very hard to 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 understand um, um, also by the cultural establishment here and what was the reason that we thought of it that way well of course um, mainly because of, uh, of of history right because uh, Ukraine uh, uh, for the longest part of its existence always belonged to the Russian Empire and to the Soviet Union um, and Obviously, of course, there are a lot of uh, connections. Uh, um, it's, uh, the connections are many, as they everywhere are. You know, there is no culture in Europe which is not immediately connected with all its neighbor cultures and with European culture in general. And if I can show some of the pictures that I was working yes. with of, of Ukrainian avant-garde um, doing research, it's just. A very few that I show of Bogomazov, for example, this is certainly one of the greatest Ukrainian futurists. Uh, just go through it if you, if that's possible. I hope it's possible. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is another great uh, work by Bogomazov. Um, and what is? What, if you go through these images, maybe you can just try to loop them a bit. Um, I'm just telling this uh, uh, for our audience here in in Amsterdam. Uh, is how in a way, completely part of all European currents they seem. Yes, of course, all these artists, not all of them, but most of them, like uh, Alexandra Extra here, and also this one, uh, they also uh, worked often in Moscow, for example, uh, but they were, as everybody in that time in Europe was, completely integrated into a pan-European cultural sphere. And if I would tell you that this particular work was produced in Italy or somewhere in uh, Eastern Europe or in Russia or in Scandinavia, you would have believed it as well, right? And it's, very, it's, it's a completely mature um, cultural world, so it's also not this idea of, oh, it's an emerging culture. No, uh, um, it maybe was in the 18th century or so, but um, at that particular, uh, you know, early 20th century, there was a thriving, very powerful uh, uh, cultural world um, in, in the main Ukrainian cities, and um, it is of course, completely unknown to us. So, um, uh, this is just one of the steps, you know, and I, again, I don't want to, to make any grandiose conclusions, you know, if we all go to acknowledge Bogomazov or this uh, artist, Vadim Meller, um, then we will have won this war, but it is something that we should have done long before, and it is the idea that, you know, only opportunistic economic ties will not do the job. And we need to engage uh, on a far more substantial level uh, with Eastern Europe um, in general. And so. that's also maybe why you posted on the first 100 days of the war every day a Ukrainian artwork, right? Yes, this w was the, um, the way that I tried to, to gain attention for this. Uh, so that it not stayed in my computer, but uh, uh, got a got an audience. Yeah, Fasil, uh, if you're still there, uh, yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think of the the analysis that Cheng just made? Yeah, I think the, uh, I'm uh, actually very thankful for this uh, because it's uh, pretty rare that uh, I'm encountering uh, this kind of approaches, especially uh, in the in the Western uh, in the Western Europe. Because uh, that's basically one of the um, one of the again consequences of uh, uh, long centuries uh, colonialism, right? When uh, when the country is being subjugated to the metropoly and just deprived of its own uh, subjectivity and agency, as in, and is not recognized uh, internationally. But that's that's definitely that this work. Has to be has to be done uh, properly for uh, for that matter because usually it's uh, also a kind of um, 
a way of a way of uh, deprivation, right? That uh, well, not not to use the word uh, uh, stealing, right? Because it's basically that pretty often we we see uh, uh, artworks which are very much uh, uh, attributed and defined by the, especially when we talk about Ukraine, uh, so uh, you, uh, the time of uh, modernism. And avant-garde, right? Like the uh, the 190s and the 10th uh, of the of the last century, as pretty often uh, they are being exhibited as uh, Russian artworks under the general term uh, Russian avant-garde, which is totally misleading term. I, I agree because uh, yeah, the avant-garde as a phenomenon was international one. Mm-hmm. It was on a pan-European scale, right? And of course, uh, Ukrainian artists uh, back then played uh, also a crucial role, as well as the Polish ones, the Belarusians, the Russians, the, the French, and uh, and so on. So I think that uh, this kind of uh, work of um, reconciliation, in a way, right, or like also um, apprehension of uh, what was... Because I think, you know, just the last point here, because I think what is really important when I hear this from somebody from the West, like researching this and really paying attention and focusing on on this uh, problematic field is that uh, because pretty often kind of because we all know that decolonial or uh, anti-colonial became a kind of a fashionable trend in the West. Like now, all the Western museums are busy with decoloniality and uh, making ma- many many events about that. that that's uh, yeah, that's a fashion, but that's very good. I, was, I totally agree with this. But the problem is that pretty often in the Western countries, uh, this decolonial the approach, they apply only to themselves and they're somehow keeping a blind eye to apply the same terms, the same notions to the outside. You know, like pretty often still, if, uh, if like I'm invited some, uh, at the discussion somewhere uh, in Germany, for instance, uh, it is usually balanced uh, with the Russian representative to make it objective, quote unquote, you know. It's as if, imagine that I invite you at the cultural event to our center in Kiev, but I am also thinking uh, like, uh, uh, no, 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 I have also to, uh, to uh, so uh, like, um, you know, as if uh, we, when I invite somebody from Indonesia uh, the, uh, or from Suriname, right, it should be also somebody from the Netherlands as well. Or if I invite somebody from Algeria, I also have to think about somebody from France. This is ridiculous. Right? Yes, that would so, be I mean, very that, much uh, frowned upon. Um, yeah. 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 So we analogy. have to also to adjust our decolonial optics, respectively, also so that it because this is very much working also in the east of Europe as well as in the West. So let's not be afraid of that. So I, I am totally grateful for this approach. Thank you. Um, Schenk, there's one way, um, one more way that art can be political. And we saw that also in the Netherlands when uh, there was a festival around Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky that got cancelled mm-hmm. uh, because we didn't really know how to handle them uh, during the war. And of course, the Dutch uh, uh, dependence of the Hermitage closed down. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you look upon those incidents? Well, firstly, um, I have uh, a lot of uh, uh, understanding, you know, for um, uh, this idea that uh, when emotions are uh, so involved um, that you you do not want to go to a program that is called, you know, Russian. Um, and we have to think about this. How, how um, what, again, what are the limits of our freedoms, uh, um, uh, and it's a, it's a, of course a very fundamental uh, uh, question. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, I think there are made a lot of very unprecise and um, also ahistorical. Um, Mm, conclusions uh, about the role of culture. Uh, so I can completely understand, you know, a, a Ukrainian who at this particular moment uh, says, I'm, you know, just f- for a few years, I'm not reading any Dostoevsky, you know. Um, th- that now. is completely understandable. Yeah. Um, 
but what I think would be the wrong approach is to say, um, to really say that Dostoevsky is responsible for what is happening. Of course, we have to look critically at all writers now and historically, uh, um, and we have to, you know, um, uh, not uh, um, deify them or you know, put them on a kind of pedestal where they go beyond any kind of criticism. But um, what I now and then often, you know, read is a complete annihilation, in a way, um, of cultural value as. A, a different domain, you know, that is not um, a, a domain where ideology and politic and politics stands um, have have the first say. Um, and so th there is a. Um, I firmly believe in the idea that art and culture are a a different realm of the world where um, a very different set of um, exchanges can take place, and um, we need that other space very much. Um, so I am also very reluctant uh, um, uh, to r really say, you know, um, well, let's take the example of Dostoevsky, you know, that he was of course a conservative, he certainly was a supporter of, of Russian imperialism, there can be no doubt about that, but to define his whole output in that particular manner, that is, it's quite nonsensical as well. So then you just don't understand how creation and art, how that functions and how it works. So it is a, it is a, um, um, a vulnerable a subject, <laughs> also because the arts are always vulnerable, right? Uh, at least that's how I interpret it. Um, so it is very necessary you know, to, to, to look again at those writers, but also from this perspective, again, from the perspective of engagement, because what, what really lacks is you know, a serious engagement at all with this, with these kind of you know um, uh, great culture from the past or from today, and then there is of course the, the very different matter of how do we deal with um, contemporary artists, you know? And um, I think there is no real hard approach, but um, the best thing I think you can do is if you want to program a, a Russian. Um, artist or uh, a musician, you know, go talk with them. And if in the end you really think, okay, th this is a political position that I cannot live with, then you shouldn't program them. And um, but it's a, it's a it's, it's a, a balancing thing. Act. And, and yeah. at least make the effort of real engagement without or you know just inviting them for nothing or throwing them away for nothing. And make the engagement, and this is yeah. Uh, yeah, what we should yeah. do. I think we can talk a, a whole evening about yeah, this course. topic. Um, <laughs> Fessel, I will give you the last word, and then I will go to the audience to see if there are any remarks or questions. Well, yeah, thanks. On that matter, it's uh, really a very multi-dimensional uh, problem, just what, uh, what we heard. But I also think that this... Um, so I partly share what uh, w what you said, but uh, the problem is that basically what you think about arts and culture as a separate realm, the problem is that the Kremlin aggressor doesn't think this way. Sure. <laughs> so uh, so we, we yes. can uh, we can all agree on this and be in, like in a democratic dialogue together, but the problem that the uh, aggression that we face. Uh, is uh, coming with a totally different approach, uh, un unfortunately, right? So in this regard, of course, uh, Germany also had uh, a great culture and Wagner and Nietzsche, and <laughs> but uh, it uh, it didn't uh, stop uh, Germans from uh, from incorporating uh, national socialism, right? So uh, that's uh, that's one, like historically speaking. But also, on the other hand, with regards to uh, contemporary artists and institutions, the problem is that basically I also experience this uh, a lot, uh, institutionally as well as personally, because I I did pay a lot of uh, time 
during the first weeks of war in order to boycott uh, Russian institutions and artists as much as possible uh, where I could uh, reach out to. Yeah, just because the problem is that, uh, can you imagine, th th there has been no Russian institution, not, si not a single one, that took a stance and uh, not even opposed the war. But they couldn't even, before it was introduced legally, they couldn't even call the war a war. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, like, as for the institutions, is like a really uh, totally deserted field, unfortunately. Yes. And as for individuals, uh, the problem is that it's not only about artists. Art and culture definitely has been used and is very much used by the Kremlin regime for uh, propaganda pur purposes. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether it's Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or whoever. They they use everything. Like usually propaganda mm. does, right? Because they are they are aiming at uh, different audiences, so that's why they are using all the tools they have. Is it from be it from history or from contemporaneity? But the problem is that what we what we are facing today in Russia didn't come out of the blue just yesterday's evening. It has been taking place and taking this shape for years and years. So the problem is that if you first accept the uh, the attack on the parliament then uh, then you swallow the absence of demonstrations then you swallow the arrest of opposition leaders then you swallow the uh, lack of uh, free media so it's step by step bit by bit and then you appear in this kind of situation so it's not only about some kremlin uh, leaders or some uh, security council or whoever is there it's also a societal responsibility for this situation because it's also the respons responsibility of the whole society and its members that they collectively agreed to that, that they collectively appeared in this situation. Because, of course, now it's uh, very hard to oppose because you would, uh, you would uh, find yourself... Uh, uh, in uh, in the detention center just uh, the next uh, the next day or even this evening it's too but late. The, uh, but but the problem is that it's uh, at, when we judge only uh, uh, at the moment of today it's already too late right you have to to see the perspective to have the to have this ability to understand how come that this regime became possible because it it was not because of some mistreatment from the side of the west is because of some inner development within the uh, Russian Federation itself. And th there is a big question and big challenges ahead of Russians uh, with regards to responsibility and guilt uh, for, uh, for decades ahead. Thank you, Fazio. So, um, as I said, we will close this Freedom Lecture with a theater scene from the play Me, War and Toy Grenade, which is written by the Ukrainian di author uh, Nina Zagochenko, I hope I say it correctly. Um, Iana Guchenko has directed this scene especially for tonight, um, and she is sitting here uh, also. Could you briefly come uh, to the stage, because I have uh, one question for you. Um, I will walk to you for a little bit. So um, we will be looking at this scene from this play. Can you tell us a little bit about what we are going to see? Yes, it's um, the play about the couple. Actually, it's about the Nina and her husband Dima Zahodinka, who is a theater director. And he right now in Avignon, actually. Yes, they with the theater open have some part play in Avignon. So and she um, wrote this story. Um, thinking about, in the first day of the war, uh, thinking about to leave Ukraine or not. So uh, she actually, with the two kids, leave the Ukraine and one month leave in the Moldova, and after that come back to the Lviv, and right now they live uh, together in Lviv. So, and this, it's uh, thinking about to leave Ukraine or not. Actually, it's only one uh, short play, and Me, War, and Toy Grenade, it's seven short play. So we're looking for opportunity to show you all this uh, play, but today only one. His name is uh, 24 Hours. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I will give the stage to um, the actors Diana Karandishivi and Tomer Pavliki.
I was 18. I was uh, standing in a square with my friends. I studied philosophy, absorbed texts of Homer and Ovidius, and I wanted to learn Greek and Latin. And what the hell? There was mandatory military training. <laughs> this is not the army, they said. This is just in case. <laughs> we pushed back. We ran cross-country, we passed the standards, we were given Kalashnikov rifles to assemble and disassemble, we bandaged our heads, we pinched our arteries, we built stretchers, we pretended there were mummy and zombie uprisings because we believed we were never going to need it. We were convinced we were killing time because we were unlucky enough to be born boys and have two extra hours on our student <laughs> schedule because there was a World War II that was never going to happen again, but the memory of it lived on in the memories in the bodies of old injured soldiers who would fetch us from the library and make us crawl on our elbows, pinch our arteries, bandage our heads and throw plastic grenades. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and now, all men who can fight are banned from leaving Ukraine. And in my hand, I hold a grenade, a plastic grenade, which I throw towards an imaginary enemy, as though it will prepare me for the real thing. Fight. Fight, fight. And then I open my, and my eyes and I run, run, run. Lika, wake up. What? Siren. This is just a test. <laughs> this is not a test. Yesterday they said. Five o'clock in the morning. This is not a test. Are they already here? No, they're in Kiev. But not here. Lika. Wake up! We need to do something! Do what? Buy food! Withdraw money! Okay, okay. I need to drink some coffee. Where do all these cars go? To the border. They turn from here to the border? Yes, from here to the border. But this is impossible. Mobilization was announced. Soon everything will be closed. Men will not be allowed to leave the country. Anton? This might be my last chance. But it's 60 kilometers. Men are not allowed to leave the country. This is a just line to the gas station. Nika, Nika, listen to me. Men are not allowed to leave. You should go. You should take the children with you. I will not leave without you. Fine. Fine. The war. The war is starting in my country today. The war with wailing sirens. It's probably in explosions on airfields at 5 a.m. Many kilometers of tanks, calum, crawled to my country from all sides, biting into her body like a bloodthirsty creature. <laughs> but my city on the west side, safe side. I withdrew money. I bought coffee, avocado, salmon. I eat breakfast. I look out the window. There is no line of cars. The oil of the gas station is over. The sun come out. Now children will wake up and we will go to the park. So far, so good. It's safe here for now. Only for now. Lika. Lika, uh, pack your backpack, quickly. Um, no. 
There are two seats in the car. Uh, they, uh, they're departing in an hour. No. Come on, Lika, I've, I'm, I've arranged everything. No. They're waiting for you. No. Lika. Anton. Lika, please, don't make this difficult. It's safe here. Safe? Yeah, safe. Safe. When the real danger gets here, it will be too late to leave. It will be a mess. There will be crowds everywhere. What, are you ready to break through the crowd with the children? Are you ready to step over the, the bodies of elderly people? Children and pets? Well, there will be no food soon. Are you ready to eat rats? If they bomb one power plant, there will be no light and electricity. Do you know how to make a fire? Are you ready to cook rats on that fire? Pigeons. What? We have a bow. We will hunt pigeons. I'm kidding. Think of the children. We have a child's bow. Lika. I really think you should leave Ukraine. I think you should be in a safe place to keep my children safe. Okay. It will be easier for me to survive alone. It will be easier without you. Look, we, we can't feed four mouths. <laughs> Look, you can't stand it without water and electricity. <laughs> you, you won't be able to wash your ass, Lika. There will be no more croissants. I will serve without croissants. I'm saying this will be easier for me without you. Look, I, I will enlist in the army. I will take up arms. I will build checkpoints. And when we're broken, we'll retreat to the mountains. We'll become partisans. You didn't want to fight. You wanted to go abroad with me. No, I don't want to fight. I don't want to. But I don't have a choice, and you do. Okay. Okay. Then... Then let's divorce. What? Let's divorce. You will take the children and go abroad. And I... I will enlist in the army, take up arms. I will leave checkpoints. If we divorce, I will retreat to the mountains. I will become too partisan. So, 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 what, you want a divorce right now? Didn't you just say I should have set my ass on that fucking bus with one-way ticket to who knows where? Marriage is temporary, my pride is forever. Okay. Anton? <laughs> my dear Anton, we have a dinner. We had some wine, some cheeses, provincial herbs in a French restaurant. Such a dinner uh, would cost 100 euros. Anton. Lika. Hmm? My dear Lika. You know what I think? I think that's a great idea. I think you are a culinary genius. Tonight, we'll eat this fantastic French meal. We'll, we'll laugh, we'll drink wine, we'll dance, <laughs> and we'll play board games. And tomorrow, you will pack your bag and put your ass on a bus, a beautiful, comfortable, double-decker bus. Like if you want to go to France, go to France. Uh, fondue, Provencal herbs, culture, croissants. You always like that liquor. Look, you will, you will be safe. You'll get a job. 
The children will go to kindergarten for free. Everything will be normal. You will get to realize all of your talents. I don't want to realize my talent. Then what the hell do you want? I want you to stop trying me to fucking bus and eat those fucking croissants. What the hell do I really want? What the hell do I really want? I want you to hug me. That will I huddled on the floor of our little hallway of our little apartment in our little town with two little dons on the body of a huge country, of a huge planet, of a huge universe in which bombs collide, volcanoes turn, stars collide, burning everything around, turning into ashes, destroying cities, destroying destinies. But now we are together, we are in our home. There is love between us and our world still holds. But what do you want then? <laughs> okay. okay, tomorrow I will get on the bus full of crying children and women to stand in line of 24 hours to cross the border. Living my heart and my life here. Today I am here. Why am I so lonely? I am so fucking lonely. Darkness is coming from the east. Death, destruction, hunger, poverty and despair. The hours crawl near, and mile by mile, the darkness creeps into my home. Bombs and screams, and then those pauses of quiet in between. The uneasy smog resting over my home. And then there's those cruise missiles Missiles who fly hundreds of kilometers and can hit any house anywhere. And in my imagination, they hit my house. A 10 floor panel building where my wife and my children sleep, ghostly protected by two blank walls in a corridor. And in my dreams, they're protected from the ash and the dust and the rubble and the screams and the burning and the darkness. I've learned like a child to be afraid of the dark. God, I, I, I have to confess, I'm a bad warrior. I was not made for this. I'm only good in total war. I'm a, I'm a good strategist, but I don't shoot well. I'm afraid that if I try to shoot someone, they'll shoot me first. A soldier told us this, that a pers person who shoots for the first time gets hit by a shockwave and can't pull the trigger. Not everything happens for the first time, and some things aren't supposed to be even happening at all. I'm just not created for war. I don't even eat meat. I'm a vegetarian. The army would be better off without me than with me. I don't want to die. I just want to live. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>